this episode of what's going on with shipping it's the march 22nd 2022 edition of what the ship top five maritime stories i'm your host sam mccagliano welcome to what's going on with shipping the what the ship edition if you hadn't done so yet please take a moment subscribe to the channel hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos when they come out let's go ahead and jump into story number one Story number one takes us to motor vessel Ever Forward, grounded in Chesapeake Bay. Just did an update on that yesterday. And if you want to see that update and other updates on Ever Forward, just click right here and you'll be able to see all the videos I've done on her. This image right here and this story by uh, Mike Schuller, G Captain, talks about the work being done to free Ever Forward. This shot is from the Dredge Oyster Bay. You're looking off the starboard side of Ever Forward. You're looking at the ship's stern, her right side of the vessel. She was supposed to be in the channel, which is to the left side of your picture there. And what Oyster Bay is doing with that clamshell digger, which is what you see at the very top there, that drops into the water, scoops up about 15 cubic yards of bottom, and then deposits it in the hopper barge to your left, that big, huge steel wall you're seeing there. Back off the stern is the Dale Pyatt. She has a bigger clamshell. Matter of fact, the biggest in the Western Hemisphere, 60 cubic yards she can clear, and she is dredging off the stern. It appears, based on the style of dredging they're doing, what they want to do is clear the spoil, the, the, the material, between the vessel's right side, which is what you see on the right side of your screen, and basically the channel, which is to the left side. And what they want to do is be able to move that spoil so they can pull her into the channel. At the same time, they're clearing off the stern to make sure the propeller and rudder is free so they can use ship propulsion to aid them in this. A couple of concerns doing this. Number one, they're not able with these types of dredges to get underneath the vessel. So the vessel will be up above the bottom that they dredge out. So you have to worry about the vessel rolling. The ship doesn't have a lot of ballast on board. It was in a fairly about half loaded, half empty condition. She probably hasn't loaded a lot of ballast on board because she would have to send the, that water, that muddy, dirty water from the inland waters through her uh, ballast water separation uh, machines and systems. And most ships don't like to do that until they're out in deep water. So she probably doesn't have a lot of ballast on board. She's got fuel oil on board, diesel fuel, which she can remove. She'll have to keep some on board for her engines. But even removing ballast and oil and, and, and fuel, excuse me, is going to make her top heavy uh, more so because that it comes from the bottom of the ship. They still may need to remove containers off this vessel. And if you're talking about taking off loaded containers, that means another barge with a large crane to be able to access those top containers. So the Coast Guard is optimistic. They're saying that they're going to get her out this week. I think they're wrong. Bill Doyle, CEO of the Port of Baltimore, who used to head the uh, Association for Dredgers in the United States, says this is going to take several weeks. That's what I think, too. I think it's going to take much more. They don't want to take any chances with this. Other stories on this. This is a story that's out on Bloomberg. Ever forward grounding follows East Coast ports rush to expand. One of the reasons we see ships this size in those East Coast ports is because of that new lane to the Panama Canal opened in 2016 that allows vessels like Ever Forward, what's called a Neo Panamax, to go through. Prior to 2016, the old locks, the ones that had been built back in 1914 in, in the two lanes, restricted ship size, width, depth to a ship capable of carrying about 5,000 containers. Ever forward can carry nearly 12,000 containers. And what has happened is East Coast ports have dredged, they've built up their ports, they've got new ship to shore cranes, and they can accommodate vessels like this. What has lagged behind? Sufficient tugs of suitable size, uh, adequate dredgers, to dredge these areas, and more importantly, salvage vessels, vessels that can do salvage in case of an accident like this. When a ship 5,000 boxes run ashore, it's a much different than a ship that is 12,000 boxes. And in the midst of all this, Evergreen places orders for new container ships. Did the same thing during Evergiven. While well, Evergiven was sideways in the Suez, they placed this mammoth order for large container ships and they're doing it again. So whenever anyone asks me is like, well, you think the container ship companies have learned their lesson, they're not gonna go big? No, they're gonna go ahead and keep going. The last thing I wanna add on this is a great video done by the crew at Marine Traffic. Marine Traffic did that image at the very beginning that I showed you, which uh, is the cover for this episode, which is the track line of Ever Forward coming out of Asia to the East Coast of the United States 
back in 2021. So I put in a request to Marine Traffic, Georgios and the crew there for this. This is the track of Ever Forward when she came through back in December. On December 21st, she went into Baltimore and then came back out a day or two later. And what this track is, it shows it. More importantly, it shows its speed. Now, the spot up above here, the circle you'll see up here, this is where Ever Forward currently is aground. Right now, she's showing just off the Virginia Capes at anchor, waiting to take her pilot. Ever Forward would have taken a pilot on board outside of Cape Charles and Cape Henry, would have boarded a Chesapeake Bay pilot that would take them all the way up the bay into Baltimore. They would have gone pier side. Uh, they would have then uh, taken the docking pilot and a harbor, uh, excuse me, a Chesapeake Bay pilot all the way back out. So I just want to show this and let this go ahead and play here. Uh, you'll see the movement of the vessel and the ships sail at a pretty good clip through the bay there. You'll see her going through almost about 12, 15 knots, eventually up to almost 20 knots going through. She's going to stop at the anchorage just south of the harbor, uh, the Bay Bridge in Annapolis. And then she is in Baltimore. And then you'll see her turn around and come back out. And I apologize, I can't really zoom this in anymore. But again, what the video shows is the speed of the vessel when she comes out at the time. And you'll see she does anywhere between 10 and 12 knots coming out uh, and then proceeds out of the bay heading out. So I'm going to go ahead and come back to that point right here where she was at so that we can uh, go through it. You'll see here she's doing 11.7 knots as she's coming down to prepare to swing into Craig Hill Channel at that time. And then right after she passes that point, she's up to 15 knots once she clears the bridge. So we know from the video that we've seen the AIS track, she was doing 13 knots when she went aground. So excessive speed, you know, she was, she'd been doing this before. So she'd made this turn in the past. So that's leading me to believe that probably the issue with Ever Forward really comes down to two things. One, mechanical. Was there a steering casualty that prevented them from switching over their steering units? There are dual steering units on a ship two different hydraulic sets, but it takes a moment or two to switch over. And then there's a non-follow-up unit too, as, as a tertiary backup. And then there's the issue of human error of some kind. Was there a communication error between the pilot and the helmsman quartermaster? Was there a difference with the, the master? Was there a loss of situational awareness? Find that hard to believe because those buoys line up like a row heading to the Bay Bridge there. So we're gonna hear the investigation, but again, we're gonna be slow to hear anything. The NTSB, Coast Guard do not release anything fast in this. We know ships are slowing down right now because of Ever Forward, where she is in regard to the channel down to about eight, nine knots. Question is gonna be is once she's free, do they keep that speed limit there? Because again, if you miss that turn, you get the position Ever Forward is in now. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to story number two. And once again, thanks to the crew at Marine Traffic. Story number two takes us to Russia-Ukraine war. Again, we're seeing the impacts from the global nature of this event. This story from Reuters and GCAP then talks about this. Ukraine could lose $6 billion in grain exports with ports blocked. This is going to be an economic disaster, not just for Ukraine, but also the world. Again, $6 billion worth of grain exports means somebody somewhere is not getting their grain. That means North Africa. That means the Middle East. It means South Asia which means grain's going to have to come from somewhere else. If you cut off $6 billion worth of grain exports, that means that other grain is going to shift and it's going to get more expensive. We're also seeing the capture of some Southern Ukrainian ports. This video that was posted by RT, it's up here on G Captain, shows Russian landing ships docking in Ukraine, offloading vehicles. One of the things we know is that as they grab these ports, in this case, this is the port of Berndiesk, I believe, yeah, Berndiesk. They're using a Russian floating crane to offload these, these vehicles and equipment onto the dock there. This is a bulk terminal. These cranes you see here are not for basically moving vehicles or anything like that. They're for offloading grain into grain ships. So they're using this floating crane and offloading. This means the Russians are using the Ukrainian ports for logistics. Uh, the Ukrainians have been targeting road convoys, soft targets, trucks, fuel tankers. They've been blowing bridges. They've been destroying railways. 
But now if the Russians can use the sea, the southern border of Ukraine along the Gulf of uh, Odessa in the Sea of Azov, the Black Sea, then the Russians are going to be able to ease a lot of their logistics because it's a lot tougher to sink a ship than it is to blow up a truck or a convoy. We also see this issue coming out about Ukraine dismisses Russian claims about drifting mines in the Black Sea. The Ukrainians have mined their, the Gulf of Odessa, and the Russians are now warning about drifting mines. Let me be clear. The minute you lay mines in the water, they're going to drift. Some of them are going to break loose. While the Ukrainians may not attribute this to themselves, it's probably happening. This is why I'm really interested why NATO hasn't deployed the mine sweeping group, which they have, into the Black Sea to because there's going to be floating mines heading south and it's only gonna be a matter of time till they're discovered by vessels engaged in commerce with Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, and even with Russia. So this is definitely going to be an issue. We saw this story come out. Bangladesh sinks $22.4 million insurance claim for missile strike on a ship in Ukraine. Uh, this is the ship where the Bangladesh crew member had been killed. Uh, they're sinking this money from the insurers uh, it's not exactly sure what the money is is in, is being used for. Uh, basically, what they want to do is obviously some reparations for the crew member that was killed, but also for the uh, vessel itself being struck. The vessel is still stuck in the port, and the crew has been removed. So the crew has been ab abandoned, basically. So they're probably looking for to cover the claim of the vessel. We also see this pre-ban Russian fuel oil still sails to the U.S. ports. So oil that had been loaded in tankers before the invasion or before the uh, ban went into effect are grandfathered in. So we're still seeing Russian oil heading to the United States and a lot of discussion about Russian oil coming to the United States. Again, the opposition to the Jones Act is making a big, huge stink about this, about the fact that we can't move oil from American uh, depots, from uh, basically oil platforms up to the refineries. Again, what they're glossing over here is the fact that we haven't built a new refinery in this country since 1977 to refine the oil we are producing. We wouldn't need to move oil if we had refineries to refine that oil. But not even that, we don't even have the refinery capacity to handle the oil we have. We're literally exporting a portion of our oil and bringing in oil that can fit in our refineries, let alone pipelines. Add to this huge amount of LNG heading to Europe uh, massive armada. This is a freight wave story. Greg Miller put this together, shows you where LNG carriers are in the world. And look at the number of crossing the Atlantic right now, heading to Europe. Uh, this is to make up for the LNG that's not going to Europe by Russia. And then finally, we talked about this at the very beginning here, U.S. grain shipping costs soar with war and drought swinging demand. We're going to see higher food costs. And that means, of course, that means inflation. That means all those elements that go into buying food, shipping food, and producing food is going to increase. And again, we're still battling other issues about getting grain out of the United States. So that's story number two. Story number three, we talked about ever forward. We talked about Russia, Ukraine. Let's talk about the United States. So right now, the U.S. is seeing a lot of issues associated with both those issues and several others. Greg Miller's story in Freight Waves, East Coast ports about to get slammed by a lot more ships. Capacity of Asia East Coast services jumped to 40 percent, jumped 40 percent versus 2020, 2021 average. Again, why is Ever Forward where she is today? Neil Panamax, she's bringing cargo in from Asia to the East Coast of Europe. And what we're seeing here is that expansion, as Greg shows here very well, statistically, because this is what Greg does. He's showing you the number of services and more importantly, the deployed capacity that has increased coming from Asia to the East Coast from early 2020 to mid 2022, what's expected coming in. And again, this, this element right here, we're seeing this story. He highlights this graph by John McCowan, who is mentioned in this story on G-Captain, where he highlighted this gains for the East Coast ports. So expect East Coast ports to increase in the amount of cargo. That also means, by the way, as we said in last week's What the Ship, that means delays at East Coast ports. The delays in New York, New Jersey, off of Norfolk, off of Charleston, Savannah, and Houston are all increasing. So we're shifting cargo from the West Coast to the East Coast, 
that's causing backlogs now on the East Coast. Yeah, we're down from 100 ships off of LA and Long Beach down to 43 at the latest count by the Marine Exchange. But again, that's the height that we had back in November. And so we, while we're down, this is a lot more. Again, normally one to two ships waiting. We're still at 43. So if you're 4,000% more than what you normally are, that's still a bit of an issue. Add to this COVID in China. Chinese port congestions worse than Sam Chambers over at Splash 24-7 with this story talking about the port congestion because of the zero tolerance, even though the ports didn't close in China, all the other areas did. And that has a knockdown effect on the ports. We also see here from Lloyd's List, the Shenzhen container shipping services remain under pressure. So we're having pulses come out of China. We had the slowdown due to the Chinese New Year. They opened back up, tsunami effect, waves of ships are coming across. And now we have a knockdown effect again and waves coming across. Understand they're designed, this whole shipping system is designed to flow at a constant pace with a little bit of fluctuations, not waves, not surges, not tsunamis coming across. That's causing issues. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing the ocean carriers blank more sailings. That means they're canceling sailings. For example, Everforward. Everforward is going to have to cancel its future sailings. That means the cargo is going to have to shift or they're going to have to get another carrier or there's going to be delays. The one thing that's really weird going on right now, and I, I haven't got a, a feel for it yet. I'm not going to lie. I don't, I don't want to say something I don't know. Is this story right here. The pay, anth pay anything mentality grips U.S. importers fearful of more shipping woe. So you've got instability because of China shifting to the west, east from the west to east coast. You've got the looming contract renegotiation with the ILWU on the west coast. Their contract expires the end of June, but spot rates have dropped tremendously. We're seeing the, the spot rates come down, but the overall freight rates are still staying very high. So I'm not exactly sure what's happening right now. But I think it's because there's a lot of instability and uncertainty in what's happening. Everybody's kind of buying into things are getting better. But at the same time, if you look at the data and the information out there, I'm not 100% sure about that. And what that tends to mean is that when there's instability in the market, rates tend to fluctuate. And that seems to be a big issue. All right. Story number three. Let's go ahead and jump to story number four. Story number four deals with the Federal Maritime Commission and the Department of Justice. On a side note, real quick, uh, we need new pictures of container ships at ports. I, I can't be clear that they're recycling these same pictures all the time. If you have a camera and you want to make some money, I think you just need to go to the ports and start taking some pictures because there's been so many stories on container shipping. We are running out of like stutter shock photos of, of vessels out at anchor. So if you've got some photos, uh, you may be able to make some money on the side. Just a quick little note on that. Anyway, back to story four. Uh, ocean carriers, U.S. export services face greater scrutiny under new FMC directive. Had that interview with Lauren Began where we talked about the fact that the Federal Maritime Commission and Department of Justice have a new memorandum of understanding that's going to allow them to investigate the nine big carriers and the three alliances a little bit more. Uh, they're going to face greater scrutiny, as Mike Schuller says in the story, but it's not just scrutiny they're going to face. This story from earlier in the week, Maersk subpoenaed in U.S. Department of Justice probe of ocean carriers. So the Department of Justice is using their subpoena power to start investigating. Uh, this is going to be interesting what happens right now. We've got two bills in, in the Congress, one in the House, one in the Senate, the Ocean Shipping Reform Act, that has the potential to give more power to the Federal Maritime Commission. As those bills get hammered out and locked into one bill, we really need several things I think need to be done. I, I mean, please, if you're in the Commerce Depart uh, commerce committees in the House and Senate, watch the video I did with Lauren Began. She's great. Get her up on the Hill to testify. Find out what we need. Why, just, just learn a little bit more about this. And I know congressmen and senators are busy, but they have staffers who do this stuff. But now we're subpoenaing uh, these companies. And again, I, I don't think there were price fixing and price gouging leading up to today. I know the prices are really high. I understand that, but that was demand. But there is a fear about this going forward. And I think this is where FMC and DOJ need to do. I also think FMC and DOJ, I know FMC, I know the chairman of the FMC, Daniel Maffei had sat there and said that he's not gonna lose his independent oversight of his commission. 
I, however, I think he needs to be very careful about this because I think the Biden administration wants that power to be able to investigate these nine big companies and blame them for inflation. Uh, we're seeing that right now. This is a marine uh, maritime executive story, FMC and the U.S. Department of Agriculture targeting improving exports from U.S. ports. Go back to the grain issue we had before. If the World Shipping Council that represents these ocean carriers want to get on the good side, they better work on getting the export containers full of cargo. There is a need. There is a worldwide need to put grain and agricultural materials in exporting containers and get them out. We nearly had a disaster in Vancouver. I don't have it as a story this week, but the Canadian Pacific was going on strike. The railway was going on strike. That was going to be cataclysmic for outloading in Vancouver. We're still backloading, backfilling in Vancouver from when we lost the railway and highways because of the Fraser River flooding. And now we have this issue where empty containers are going out. Listen, Port of LA and Long Beach are doing phenomenal amounts of cargo. Things are improving. They're doing great. They still have a massive backload of containers, both full and empty in their yards. They're only down maybe a third of where they were back in November when it comes to loaded containers and maybe 15, 20% from where they were with empty containers, maybe a little bit more. But this is an issue. The carriers, uh, ocean carriers and, and, and shippers over in Asia are screaming for empty containers, but we need to be able to get exports out. And listen, if you're the World Shipping Council, you're John Butler, you need to do more to do this. I understand you want to highlight the dangers of this, but now you're not just dealing with an American public that wants these, these containers loaded with agricultural materials, but we're talking about a worldwide issue brought about by Russia, Ukraine. So this issue and how the U.S. government deals with the ocean carriers, I think, is going to become a even more important as we go on. So again, big issues. That was story number four. Let's go ahead and jump to our last story of the day, story number five. As always, story number five is the one I find the most interesting. It may not be to everybody else, but it is to me. And this is a G-Captain story written by Ira Breskin, who I know very well. Ira is a professor at the State University of New York Maritime College, author of The Business of Shipping, uh, latest edition. And he writes this story that American Seal of Capacity gets a much needed booster shot with addition of 12 ships. Uh, Biden's $1.5 trillion federal spending bill includes funds for 10 tankers and two cable layers to be added to the U.S. Maritime Administration's tanker security program and cable security program. Now, this is not money to build them, but money to provide to ship owners and ship uh, charters to bring these vessels into the U.S. fleet and keep them there. This is meant to offset the higher operating costs for U.S. ships versus foreign flag using foreign crew members. And again, in particularly the issue regarding tankers is extremely important with the closing of the Red Hill tanker facility, did a whole video talking about that right here, and the cable layers which monitor our underwater cables. Look at what happened with the explosion off of Tonga when the cable was severed and Tonga went without its outside connection to the world. Uh, this is, I think, a fairly significant story. It's really important to be done. However, I am leery that this gets implemented in a fast, efficient manner. The U.S. Department of Defense has been given money to buy ships to replace in the surge sea lift fleet. They haven't procured any ships at all. The market out there right now for used shipping, secondhand shipping, is at a premium. If you got a boat and you can charter it, man, it's 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 going pretty good. And especially with tankers right now, because of the boycott and the sanctions against Russia, tankers are going to become a premium. I think we need to do more than this. I think we need to bring the Jones Act tankers into a similar program where they can lay these ships up into a reduced operating standard uh, status or use them to support the DOD, Department of Defense fleet. Last year, according to the Military Sealift Command, one-fifth of all the oil and fuel transported around the world was done in foreign flag shipping. There's no reason that should be done. They should be in U.S. flag vessels. That's our stories for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. I want to take just one last moment and thank everyone who watches this channel. Tomorrow, uh, March 23rd, is really the anniversary of this channel. Uh, a year ago uh, tomorrow, Ever Given went sideways in the Suez Canal. 
I was asked to do some guest appearances on some TV shows, BBC and a whole slew of others. And for six days, it was a whirlwind for me. But I decided to do uh, videos with a buddy of mine, John Conrad from G Captain, put them on my YouTube channel. I had a YouTube channel going back a long time. I'd posted videos that I found interesting from lectures I gave from conferences, some things on US shipping and, and military sea lift and the Jones Act. But to give you an idea, on March uh, 23rd, I had a grand total of three views of my entire channel. Uh, the following day, uh, it had increased to over 3,000 views. And to give you an idea of how this channel has grown <laughs> since that time to, the, to today, over 3.1 million views of the channel. That is impossible without you, the viewers. And I wanna thank you for that. The growth of the channel has been amazing. I have over 35,000 subscribers of this channel. Actually, I had a few hundred when this started. So the idea that I have 35,000 subscribers is, is just to me amazing. And I hope, I, I sincerely hope that this channel provides you information about the shipping industry that you're not getting out there from the mainstream, from the media, and it provides you insight. I, I'm really amazed by the people who watch this channel, everyone from the government to experts in the field, to people doing it from mariners, to people who have no idea about shipping, but are just interested in it. Uh, I get notes all the time from people from around the world who appreciate this, this video. And in particular, I wanna thank the 53 Patreons who support us. Uh, Patreon, you know, is, is, is a couple of dollars a month. People subscri uh, subscribe to the channel. They give some money and understand what that allows me to do is buy equipment for the channel. It allows me to subscribe to new sites that are behind paywalls. Uh, a lot of the sites I show you are not behind paywalls. I don't want you to have to go behind a paywall. So I try to avoid posting those, but I go behind the paywall to get that information to build into my news stories. So I want to thank those Patreons, everyone who's been a Patreon. And, you know, ask again, and I hate to ask, but I really do. But if you like this channel, please subscribe, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos, share it across social media any way you can, leave a comment. And if you can, I, and again, I appreciate it, become a Patreon, support the channel. I'll have the information right here at the end of the video. You can just click on the Patreon symbol and go over to it. I'll have the Patreon information in the show notes. I want to thank everyone who's been on this wild ride for a year now. I'm hoping we keep going. I just hope we keep seeing this channel grow. Uh, literally today, I just did an interview with NBC about the Ever Forward. I just did a podcast with Bloomberg, their Odd Lots podcast. This is a podcast that has interviewed the likes of Gene Soroka, uh, the uh, former Port Envoy, John Picari, Ryan Peterson, the CEO of Flexport, uh, Craig Fuller, the CEO of Freight Waves. Uh, and, and for me to be included in that group is, is humbling, if not a little unbelievable, to tell you the truth. So I appreciate everybody who watches this. And from behalf of myself and the crew here at What's Going On With Shipping, who, by the way, are, are basically sound asleep back here. Uh, Macy back here. Come here, Peanut. And, and Peanut right here. That is the staff here at What's Going On With Shipping. We appreciate everything. So until our next episode, uh, this is Sal signing off. Thanks again.